Top Med Talk. Hello, this is Desiree Chapel, host of Top Med Talk at the Royal College of Anesthetists Anesthesia 2018. We are live from the British Museum in London. I'm here with my co-host, Professor Monty Mythen, Editor-in-Chief. Hello, Monty. How are you? Hi, Desiree. Good. Thank Good. you. Good. And we also have Dr. Liam Brennan, President of the Royal College of Anesthetists, as well as Professor Paul Miles. He's the Director and Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine at the Alfred Hospital and Monash University from Melbourne, Australia. Hi, gentlemen, you? thank you so much for joining us and sitting down this afternoon. Great to be here. <laughs> Good. Well, it's been a wonderful day on this uh, first day of Anesthesia 2018, the inaugural meeting. And we're just wanting to sit down and talk to you a little bit about this international perspective on anesthesia and perioperative care that you guys started the conference with today. Um, can you give us a, a little bit about what you spoke, uh, what you were speaking on, and uh, what your thoughts are on how the day was? Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Liam, uh, Dr. Brennan, we'll start with you. Okay, so um, I'm d delighted to be hosting this conference today on behalf of the Royal College of Anesthetists. So I started the day by talking about a little bit about the college and how we have progressed in the past 70 years. It's the 70th anniversary of the birth of the National Health Service here in the UK. Our, our national um, um, health delivery service for all UK citizens that is free at the point of delivery that we're incredibly proud of. And anaesthesia has a huge amount to uh, thank the NHS for in its development. It's provided the vehicle by which we have grown as a specialty and become a coherent specialty. It's allowed us to do many of the quality improvement and research studies that we, uh, we perform on behalf of uh, the college and behalf of, this, of the, uh, the specialty. And, and I talked something about those. And I know that perioptic medicine uh, is absolutely crucial to that agenda. And Paul and I um, really shared those thoughts in both our talks this morning. Yeah. yeah, so I was really um, delighted to follow uh, Liam's presentation this morning. I was asked, in fact, probably challenges is a better word, to actually give an international perspective of what perioperative medicine is and how it might relate to both the aims of the Royal College here in the UK and what's happening in our part of the world, Australia New Zealand, and of course in the US and other parts of the world. And um, what struck me really was, in fact, uh, the concerns that uh, anaesthetists or an anesthesiologists have all around the world are, are, are very common. There's a common, um, you know, a series of themes around the fact that we've got an aging population. They have a lot of comorbidity. They're uh, having now more and more uh, extensive and major operations. Uh, and our figures and results are really quite fantastic. But of course, we, we can always do better. There are avoidable complications that um, can be better managed. Um, and for that to work properly, we need uh, more multidisciplinary team-based care. The anaesthetist or anesthesiologist has got a lot of experience in dealing with that type of complexity. Uh, we already work as teams in the operating room. We've got to sort of spread that out um, right from the early uh, preoperative period right through to full recovery in the days and weeks after surgery. So, Paul, you were very flattering in your talk about suggesting that whatever it means. It's not a competition, but the Royal College of Anaesthetists has been leading the way in the more recent adoption of perioperative medicine in the broadest sense, whereas I think we would very much look to, to, to you in Australia and your department in particular as being some of the leaders of perioperative medicine. Now, it was very flattering of you, but what prompted you to, to say that apart from the invitation? <laughs> oh, well, I, 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 I hope and I, I do believe I was being quite genuine about that. I mean, I... Personally, I think our department back in Melbourne has sensed that uh, perioperative medicine is the future of our specialty. Um, but to be, for us, uh, to be viable or competent uh, perioperative physicians, we need to have stronger foundations in the education, training, and also research around perioperative medicine. So that's, I think, something that we've had at a more personal level. And we've built up, I think, a fantastic postgraduate training program for that. Uh, but that aside, I think uh, in part because of uh, the wonderful NHS system here in the UK uh, and the college has been working with government uh, and the other colleges to really try and work together to come up with new ways or better ways of uh, dealing with the um, uh, management of patients through the whole surgical experience. And I think that, that kind of national uh, public focused um, efforts uh, led by the Royal College here in the UK, um, has been groundbreaking. It really has paved the way for that. 
Uh, so, Lee, uh, Lee, sorry to, I know you're going to come in on this, but because I want to praise your presidency, you, you, in, you inherited this in its, in its uh, developing form. And I think if we reflect back at the beginning of your presidency, you're just coming to the end of your period as president now. We seem to have gone from a degree of scepticism mixed in with what we inherited from the wonderful J.P. Van Bissau through to what feels like certainty about this in the future. Sorry, you were going to say... I can't no, you. and I, I think that's right. And I was so pleased today in uh, one of our keynote addresses was from Dr. Steve Powis, Professor Steve Powis, who is the NHS uh, Medical Director for the whole of England. So the most senior doctor responsible for the health service in, in England. And he praised the de development of perioperative medicine specifically in his talk uh, today. And I was incredibly proud to hear him saying that it is now starting to become part of the, uh, the vocabulary of senior decision makers and politicians in this country. So I think we are beyond the tipping point now. I think we are well beyond the visionary phase. We are now into implementation and it is now gathering pace. Yeah, um, one of the things I was looking at too as we looked down the schedule and some of the, and reflecting on, on some of the different presentations today, we're really going over um, the elements of uh, those global kind of ideas about anesthesia care and perioperative medicine and how those uh, relate to everyone and Paul you kind of mentioned that mentioned that before how um, some of these topics are, are very relatable relatable um, when we talk about curriculum and teaching these things uh, Dr. Brennan when we interviewed you back at the ASA and you were talking about how we have outreach to other providers in, in other countries. Um, what is what is the, uh, the college doing to for outreach and, and curriculum for those particular providers? So outside of the UK, mm -hmm. so we're, we've now got a global partnership program that uh, is at, in its early in, in, in its infancy. We are doing a lot in, in already. We're doing some work in the, in developed world countries and in Hong Kong and uh, and in Iceland to build uh, that infrastructure in education, learning, and around perioperative medicine. But also in the developing world, in low and middle income countries, we're doing work in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly around East Africa, in uh, in in Zambia in particular, where we are starting to build that to meet. Uh, the vision of what perioptive medicine means for local needs. It will be different from uh, the, of the of the, of the uh, spectrum of disease that we see here in 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 uh, in the UK and Australia and, and the US. Um, you know, it, it's not going to be around uh, the obese population. It's not going to be around um, uh, the consequences of alcohol and and and, uh, and cigarettes and cigarette misuse. It is going to be around some more fundamental issues around infectious disease and how we manage those those issues. So making it more fit for purpose and adaptable, I think, is the challenge. So, Paul, on that subject, the, there's often a question. You know, most of the world is not getting access to the type of healthcare we regard as relatively normal. Has this perioperative medicine agenda got anything to offer the, the global challenge for access to healthcare? Because I know there have been some developments in relatively less well-resourced countries. Well, I, I think it does really. I mean, some of the key principles of what good perioperative medicine would be, uh, things like teamwork, things having shared understanding, uh, things that avoiding gaps in care that might otherwise happen uh, with a fragmented healthcare system. So those principles, I think, are universal and they don't cost much money. It's really about just the way we work, the way we're trained. And if we do that in a fairly coherent way um, in all parts of the world, then in fact everybody, um, and certainly the patients we care for, uh, will have better outcomes. Do you think some of those countries might get well ahead of us in actually being able to, in, in them starting off their journey of the better provision of surgery care, jump ahead to what looks like a fully developed perioperative medicine model because they won't be they won't have the sea anchor yes. of our traditional care practices yes I, th I mean i think the word disruption was used today which i think is a really good phrase uh, where we as specialists are often caught up in the old paradigms of care the silos of care and so on we have to break some of those down uh, retrain ourselves uh, and of course pass it on to the junior trainees who are coming now uh, as specialists um, in systems where they've got little um, such um, uh, kind of um, you know, parochial specialties um, who are actually really trying to do the bare minimum as best they can with few resources uh, already are working very well together to problem solve and to come up with the best care they can as a team. Um, so 
I think there's great opportunity there, there for them to actually get ahead much quicker. So, so one of the points I made in my talk this morning was that uh, that the birth of the NHS gave parity of esteem for anaesthetists in this country. I think for many of the low and middle income countries, they are still at that point or even earlier where there are very few physician anesthesiologists uh, and we need to raise that, uh, uh, we need to ra raise the, the numbers of those uh, practicing in those areas. But once they're there and the ones who are already there have got to be given the same esteem and regard uh, as alongside their surgical colleagues. That's going to be essential to developing this team approach that we all um, think is essential to perioptive medicine. Can you remind us about that, Liam? Because the history of that is, is very interesting because we, we got right close to the wire as I understand in the formation of the NHS sure and we there was a potential for us being part of the surgery team not an independent profession right at that moment sure which. so post post-war 1948 just after the second world war we we had a, um, a, a socialist government came into power in this country and their vision was that we would have a national health service free at the point of delivery and regarded and I think it was visionary at that time that to be essential to that that all doctors working uh, within the service should have parity of esteem and um, anaesthetists were raised overnight from being uh, a second-class citizen, if you like, within the hospital infrastructure to being on a par with the surgical and the physicianly colleagues. And that was, a, that was a quantum leap for the specialty in this country, and that was reflected in how we developed initially as a faculty of anaesthetists and then subsequently as a college and as a royal college. And for that, we are incredibly grateful in this 70th year. How did that happen elsewhere? Do you know, do you know Paul? Did it just you follow suit? I'm not suggesting that we, we were uh, leading the way, but... Uh, yeah, well, I think, I mean, that's a really interesting point, really. I think um, that sense, that sort of more egalitarian sense that was embedded in the NHS from the start, um, I think, uh, certainly not just helped our specialty, but I think improved... Uh, I guess respect for all the players involved in the care of a surgical patient. I guess it's one of the reasons why uh, perioperative medicine has worked very well in the UK system. Australia's got a, a, a sort of a hybrid system. Uh, it also has a national health scheme, um, but a higher amount of private practice medicine within the country. Uh, and of course other parts of the world, particularly North America, it's even more so. Um, so these, these features are there, but what I think was really right there at the start with the NHS was around public service, public good. Uh, the centre was healthcare for the population. Uh, that wasn't the case in traditional areas of medicine elsewhere. It was often doctor focused and there was hierarchical systems. Um, I think where we are now with perioperative medicine is again we have everyone's talking about patient centred care, team based care, um, but for some parts of the world that's been a harder change to um, uh, move into than perhaps in the uh, UK system. Uh, yeah, that's a great a, a great point. I, I think that um, trying to develop leadership within the perioperative medicine model and, and having anesthesia to lead that is, is is good. But making sure you're still staying aware that it is a team team approach and yeah. everyone involved is, is as important as the others. It, so. it is it is Desiree, it is a team approach. It's not mm -hmm. anesthesia, anesthesiologist dominating it. Yeah. It's orchestrating it. Yeah. I think that's where we see our role. I think we're the ideal people to do that because we have that over overview of what's happening for the patient and we see that we see the truly do see that bigger picture. Okay. And it, it we does allow us to orchestrate and to bring those different expertise to bear when the patient requires it. We're not going to do it all as uh, as anesthesiologists. Um, when we need a specialist physician to advise on, on a kidney problem or a, a cardiac problem, that's when we get our specialist colleagues uh, involved. But we can orchestrate it and actually we can, with our expertise, deli deliver m m the majority of it ourselves. Yeah. One person, I, I can't remember who was, making a point about um, that being part of education in the anesthesia is, a is actually how to lead the team and how to be in that. Because I think that maybe is not necessarily always discussed or uh, <laughs> um, approach that there are different ways to lead and lead change management which is part of that perioperative model and as well. And we were delighted at the end of today to have the keynote lecture, the rank lecture being mm -hmm. given by Professor 
uh, Jennifer Weller from Auckland, where she talked about just that. How do we build teams? How do we break down that silo working yeah. so that we do what's right for that person at the center of the care in the operating room, which is the, is the patient? Yeah. So not only do we lead care, but we lead the team to come together and, sure. and help those help them break. Well, um, one more question, just highlights from today. Dr. Brennan, what was one of your highlights? Well, I'm going to take something slightly different from today, and that was the discussion that we had with uh, an inspirational figure here in the UK called Claire Gerarda, and we talked about the issues surrounding wellness, around stress, burnout, and the mental health issues that we know are all too prevalent in healthcare and and, and amongst uh, anaesthetists, anesthesiologists, and her perspectives about how we need to do better to try and improve the lot of our colleagues, how we need to help each other, how we need to recognize that and, and support each other. Uh, yes, it does need to be about system-wide solutions, but we need to do better at supporting each other within the teams in which we work. Yeah, we actually were fortunate enough to have Claire uh, on the podcast and tell a little bit about what her experiences are and provide uh, resources you know, for, for us uh, practitioners um, out there. Before we get to that uh, with Paul on that, we were discussing the fact that from the college's perspective, if anyone has a a problem that relates to addiction, for example, there's absolutely no problem at all putting your hand up and saying, help me. There's it? absolutely no problem in, in, in doing a, that. It's a must-do. It, it, it is a must-do. It's, it's a must-do for you as an individual. It's a must-do for, for your patients as well. Of course yeah. it is. Uh, and, and I think the barriers to that are starting to break down. The stigma yeah. is breaking down. I think by us talking about it, by us putting this on a, on a, on a top med talk, yeah. will help people. And I know you've done that previously, Monty, yeah. uh, and I heard the inspirational talk you had from one of, the, one of your colleagues Paul in the US. Wishma, we were Paul, it was that. great. And uh, I think the more we talk about it, we need to say there's no shame in this. We're human, and we're the, we've got the, we have the same frailties and the same problems uh, as any of the other members of the, of the patients that we treat. We can be patients ourselves and we need to be open to that. And if you speak out on behalf of a colleague or you point out a possible issues, you're, you're not whistleblowing and getting them into trouble. No you're, no. you're looking after their well-being. No, you're not. And there are confidential programs. The P- practitioner health program that Claire leads in the UK is an ideal opportunity to be able to seek help. So I cut you off on your highlights, Paul. Desiree was asking you about Oh, yes. Yeah, so I, I mean, I was really delighted to be wedged between um, both uh, Lee and Brennan's talk this morning, which is really a reflection on uh, what the college has has achieved really in these last number of years, which is was so wonderful to hear myself, let alone I think for the audience. Uh, and also of course the med- medical director of the NHS talking about his vision of where the NHS should be going to and what need, needs to kind of, I guess, evolve. Um, and, and I guess what struck me about both those presentations was this sense of engagement with uh, the providers of the funding of healthcare uh, in, in, in the UK system, of course, it's the NHS, it's the government, of course. Uh, but it might be private payers in, in other health systems. And it, it's about us explaining our value, where we can actually make things better in a way that's actually for the good of patient care. So I, I really, for me, that was really um, uh, the rewarding part of the day. Yeah. Great. Well, um, any other uh, final thoughts or things that you're looking forward to uh, for tomorrow on day two? So looking forward to a second day, um, some more inspirational talks and a great audience and a, pack, a packed house of, yeah. uh, of 350 delegates. It's been great. The program's been absolutely fantastic and uh, participants as well. Um, I'll, I'll give a big plug for clinical research. I think, <laughs> I think that's go. what really drives a yeah. uh, better understanding of what we should do and how to do it better. Uh, and if that's built into the health system, I think we'll all, all, all be better for it. Great. I'm going to give a plug for Top Med, top med Talk. We've, we've, we've had about 400 downloads so far today, so we've effectively virtually doubled your numbers. We're just pushing on to 25,000 downloads in total in 83 countries. I just think this way of sharing thoughts with the world at little or no expense to the individuals is a big plus yeah, yeah thanks for doing it certainly the way yeah. forward monty yeah. thank you well, well done gentlemen thank you so much for sitting down with us this afternoon and uh, we look forward to day two of anesthesia 2018 thanks so thank much thank you uh-huh. thank you top mid talk